Ladies and gentlemen, um, good evening. I know um, this is the other, uh, today's uh, last session. That's why the other, actually, not over 100 people coming, but the other, actually, I hope you can enjoy, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the uh, session of the uh, town hall session, the title, the uh, lies of uh, the impact of the lies of generative AI on developing countries, developing economies, opportunities, and threats. Um, I'm the uh, organizer and the, uh, the uh, today's on-site moderator. Uh, my name is Tomoyuki Naito, vice president and professor at the uh, Graduate School of Information Technology, Kobe Institute of Computing. Very nice to meet you, everyone. Then um, let me just. Uh, let me just um, quickly e introduce um, all of the other panels um, from myself. Um, on my just left-hand side, um, Ms. Safa Karit um, Sariari. Um, she's the, the Senior Business Intelligence Engineer and the Software Engineer, Central Bank of Sudan, uh, the Republic of Sudan. Uh, Safa, welcome. And uh, next um, to uh, Ms. Safa, um, Mr. Robert Fonokusi. Uh, he is the founding partner and CEO of Orasoft Limited, the Republic of Rwanda. Uh, Mr. Ford, thank you for coming. And uh, um, actually, uh, today uh, uh, we expected to have the other Ms. K. McGowan, the senior director uh, of policy, the Digital Impact Alliance, but uh, due to the other her uh, immediate uh, kind of the other um, the engagement, she couldn't uh, make it. So uh, today um, we have the other privilege to have the other Dr. Salayu who, uh, Narjan. Uh, she's the other founder of the other uh, Apti Institute India. Um, doctor, thanks for coming. And last but not least, um, on my left-hand side part, um, Mr. Uh, Atsushi Yamanaka, uh, Senior Advisor for this uh, Transformation Japan International Cooperation Agency Japan. Uh, Mr. Yamanaka, thank you for joining us. I'm also looking at the other Zoom online. Um, we have quite a number of participants online. Um, over 20 people are joining. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining today. So, uh, as Scheduled and as title, we'd like to uh, begin the, uh, the, uh, the title, the impact of the lies of generative AI on developing economies, opportunity and threats. Let me just uh, begin with the, the very brief uh, introduction, a very brief explanation of the background of this the, uh, the, uh, session. Maybe many of you, um, attendance here and attendance online, as well as the panelists, you have already heard many discussions in the past two days, in the including today's discussion um, throughout the, the IGF 2023 in Kyoto. Actually, the Internet for All or Internet um, we want, Internet for Everyone, Internet for Good. This is the kind of the common keyword for today's uh, the this year's IGF. On top of that, even the yesterday's uh, official opening ceremony, Prime Minister Kishida of Japanese government, um, he mentioned about the importance of generative AI and the importance of the guideline, importance of the, the she, knowledge sharing, uh, information sharing, and the collective uh, effort to make AI for good for everyone. On standing on that kind of background, actually many AI-related sessions have been done, and uh, this discussion or th that kind of the session is still ongoing until the end of IGF 2023 in Kyoto. Then, this session is specifically focusing on generative AI's impact, specifically for the, uh, the uh, how it will be impact on the uh, the global south. Actually, uh, I don't want to divide north or south, but actually this is very, very important because there are two aspects, opportunity and threats. Threat side, many sessions have been discussing about the, uh, the potential threat on uh, privacy, uh, human rights, or information security. Of course, all those things are very scary, the, uh, the uh, generative AI correct 
the information from everywhere, then synthesize all the other data into one, as if we don't know how it is you know, synthesized. But uh, many experts, international experts, as you already heard uh, throughout the other session, many international experts already aware about those kind of threats, and the other day have already shared their knowledge, their you know, the worries to everyone, including us. So that yeah, the process is already ongoing. Then I personally have felt that that aspect, threat aspect, is not necessary. We have to you know, fear, we have to worry so much because many experts or many people have already aware about the other worries so that we can protect somehow by using the collective wisdom, collective knowledge, collective the effort. On the other hand, other hand opportunities. Opportunities wise, uh, I personally don't see many discussions are happening uh, in this IGF, but uh, we also know that uh, many opportunities we have seen. So. I will invite these the other um, knowledge panelists, and I would like to invite all of your opinion, both from on site and the online. Um, then I'd like to allocate first uh, 20 minutes or the 25 minutes for the other um, to hear the opinion from the other panelists here, and the other another half of this session the last uh, 20 minutes or 25 minutes, I really would like to have you guys the opinion or the, or the comments about opportunities. And of course, threat side, you can share your opinion. That would be really, really welcome. So um, my first question to the other, all the panelists, question number one is, Actually, uh, go to the other very fundamental one. Actually, uh, uh, in order for all of you to know about the other experts' uh, background, uh, knowledge, and wisdom, I want um, invite all panelists to answer to us. So question number one, what has been your background in terms of the other related works in ICT sector in the light of using power of technology to make the better world? So let me just uh, invite uh, one by one, uh, starting from the other, um, Ms. Safakari. Thank you, Sensei. I am truly honored to be here today. Thank you all of us to attend this session. I am Safa Khalid from Sudan. I start my journey in ICT since uh, 2010, while I work in, in Central Bank of Sudan. Uh, my specialization is business intelligence and uh, software and engineering. While I'm working in Central Bank, we pass through data analysis for multiple systems that we can uh, see now generative AI can help us to reduce a lot of time of working and it help us to make a many prediction model for crisis, sometimes happen in, in any country. And also, uh, when you're using generative AI, it is a benefit for all central bank reaching back economy of the country, like maintaining financial stability of country or promoting economic development of the country in uh, Sudan or in another country. Also now, when you're thinking about the fintech technology, generative AI can help us in uh, customer experience and it can build us many customer experience system which can address an emergency situation for customer instead of waiting for next day to go to the bank and found solution for your actions. And uh, also enhance um, any part of uh, analysis tool and prediction for any module. This really happened, for example, in the last year before uh, the world start in Sudan, when we have an auction, you can use generative AI to build simulation for the policy instead of just impressing and using the policy directly in the, in the economy. This simulation, if you implement it, it can help us to, to find the weaknesses of the policy instead of using directly to your economy. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Okay, um, Mr. Robert Ford, please go ahead. Um, thank you, my name is Robert Ford. Um, I'm, I'm currently leading uh, 
uh, a software testing qualifications team in Rwanda under the Rwanda Software Testing Qualifications Board. Uh, one of the uh, <coughs> members of the International Software Testing uh, Qualifications Board. Um, but before that, uh, I was supporting the government of Rwanda under the United Nations in <coughs> designing the implementation plan for the Child Online Protection Policy, which <coughs> Rwanda designed a couple of years ago. And <coughs> it's now a framework that is helping the country in uh, setting proper guidelines for uh, <coughs> safety for child uh, online uh, engagement. Uh, but before that, I participated a lot in the regional framework for the one network area for the East African region. Uh, for some of you <coughs> who may not know the ESC framework, the East African community co is composed of six countries. Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, South Sudan, and Burundi. <coughs> and uh, at some point under the framework, they wanted to create one network area having inbound, outbound traffic, data traffic, uh, as one network uh, traffic so that they can circumvent the costs of, of data roaming for <coughs> people in the region. So in a couple of years, we were able to set uh, the one network area, the first actually uh, <coughs> a proof of concept ever tested uh, around the world. And in that, <coughs> I was specifically more uh, on the component of cross-border mobile financial services, uh, helping uh, citizens in the countries in that region to transfer and transact uh, uh, financially between nations using uh, what is properly known as mobile money. Um, <coughs> I have uh, participated uh, at AFRINIC, uh, the Internet Numbers Registry for Africa. Um, <coughs> but after that, I'm now currently engaged with, uh, with JICA, with the Japan government, uh, in implementing uh, a project in Uganda. Uh, it's an ICT industry promotion project. It's a four-year project with four major outputs uh, that are supposed to help the country build capacity, stronger capacity in the ICT industry. All right, thanks very much, Mr. Ford. Okay, um, Dr. Salayu uh, Natarajan, could you go ahead, please? Thank you very much. Thank you for um, enabling me to be a part of this conversation. It's a very important one, both in understanding the disadvantages and advantages and some of the risks of uh, generative AI. Uh, thanks also to the audience. I know it's 6 p.m. here, and it must be a range of different times across the world. So thank you for joining online as well. Um, my name is Sario Natarajan. I am the co-founder of Apti Institute, uh, which is an institution that works uh, on questions at the intersection of technology and society. We have three big areas of work. We focus on algorithmic and platform-mediated work. Uh, we look quite extensively at digitization and digital infrastructure and the ways in which governments and states can reach their citizens, uh, particularly on questions of sustainability financing, governance, uh, replication of digital systems across the world, um, and also extensively on questions of data and data governance. Uh, and AI, and particularly generative AI as a theme, is one that cuts across all of these areas. Um, and we've been exploring it quite significantly, hopefully more over the course of this conversation. Back to you, Dr. Naito. Thanks very much, um, Dr. Sahari. And uh, uh, Mr. Atsushi Yamanaka, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Well, it's very hard to actually be so very concise such introductions than my predecessor now. And thank you so much actually for joining this session. I, uh, you guys actually are very brave because you actually could not actually resist uh, the urge of actually having a GIZ, uh, you know, reception downstairs. <laughs> so thank you so much actually for your, you know, effort of coming to this session. So my name is Atsushi Amanaka. I'm actually senior advisors on uh, digital transformations at JICA. Um, JICA, we actually trying to promote uh, the expo, the improved well-being of all right now. Um, incorporating a lot of actually digital technology elements into different actually projects and then support initiatives. Um, but prior to that, I've yeah, been actually doing this field for quite a long time actually. This is my 28th year, in fact, it's like, <laughs> I feel so old about that, um, of pursuing ICT for development. Um, 
initially, like I was in uh, UNDP, and then I actually was involved quite intimately in the wishes process. So it's really personal for me to be here, and it's really happy to see IGF actually came to Kyoto, um, and also discussing about how <coughs> this process is going to actually help, um, you know, finally, hopefully, um, change the world for better place using these technologies. And AI certainly is one area where it's going to have a lot of potentials and also a lot of threats as well. So it, it, this is conversation is very timely and I'm really happy to be part of this. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. So um, um, for the sake of time, let me just quickly go to the, uh, the core of today's session. This is the core question to all the panelists. My second question to all the panelists. Do you think that the rise of generative AI represented by chat GPT is a good thing to the economic and social development aspect of developing economies? Please answer by yes or no, and with your very succinct reasons, please. Maybe let me just um, you know, um, start uh, with Yamanaka. -san. Thanks, thank you, Naito Sensei. Can I say maybe <laughs> <laughs> or uh, depend? <laughs> up well, to you, up it's, to you. It's, uh, it's you know I understand that you want a very precise answer with yes or no, but I don't think I'm qualified to say yes or no. So would it be okay? Like yeah, it's okay. It's, it's okay. okay. Up to thank you. you so much. <laughs> yes. Well, in a way, yes, because um, we actually had a, um, a colleague. Actually, we we sent him to to Japan. He studied AI. He actually did actually a PhD here in Japan, and he was actually doing a research on generative AI models for African language. Now he actually he was actually in a Riken, one of the top actually research institute in Japan, but now he unfortunately he for Japan he actually moved to Princeton to continue his work. But having that kind of local language model actually um <coughs> incorporated into the uh, you know the generative AI could really open up the opportunities for those people who are actually unconnected or not uh, digitally in involved in it. Because of high sort of um, uh, barriers in terms of digital literacies. And this, so this inclusion has been a major challenge. And then this has been, you know, the issues for last 20 years. And the last peoples, last 2.6 billion people is gonna be the most and hardest people to reach. So if for that, I think AI, and specifically having the local language uh, generative AI models could have opportunity to open up the opportunity for them. So that's yes. The no part, yes, of course there's a threat. Um, we talked a lot about um, in terms of like misinformation, malinformation, disinformation. There is even industry in, uh, I think it's Northern Macedonia, where this village actually churn out all these actually malinformation. It's a business. So people who want to actually have this malinformation, they actually hire these people in this particular village and it became an industry. And it's getting very, very difficult for us to distinguish if any information is actually real or not. So that's, I think, is gonna be a huge threat in terms of information accuracies and the trust that we actually have in the internet or you know, to the digital technology as a whole. So that's actually yes and no. And I'm sure that uh, my you know, fellow participants also have the similar okay. yes and no moment. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, um, Dr. Sar um, Dr. Sarai, please. Yeah. Um, thank you, and I will take uh, again a response which is yes if we attend to questions of governance um, and regulation. Uh, I do think, I mean, yes and no, yes if if we uh, <laughs> take a, uh, ta I, I mean, I feel like to, to think about generative AI without thinking about the consequences and the harms, which occur at all different levels, both in or injustices of uh, generative AI occur at several levels. Uh, one, there is the level of uh, labor. Generative AI does not exist without the labor of several workers in very many parts of the developing world. 
Um, so to talk about it, abstract it from the way in which generative AI is itself created, which is the labor of data annotators and labelers, uh, that might be a bit limiting. And so that needs to be a part of the conversation. Um, second is I think the way in which data itself is structured, uh, which is that it often excludes um, you know, the presence of data pertaining to gender, race, et cetera, um, may limit the capabilities of generative AI, so the applicability and use in context in the developing world may be limited. I think the third, of course, is what uh, uh, you mentioned, um, Mr. Yamanaka, which is around the consequences such as disinformation and misinformation, uh, which generative AI makes very easy. So with this framework of the kinds of injustice that generative AI may bring about, uh, we can start to think about both what are the use cases and how may we govern them to ensure that all of us you know, have uh, meaningful digital lives and digital futures. Uh, I'll pause here and look forward to the rest of the discussion. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, that's a very good point and a very important point. Mr. Yamanaka emphasized about the local language issues and uh, Dr. Sarah, you mentioned about that. Start with the, the use case, then uh, we can deepen the more discussion. That's very important and uh, such a e significant um, uh, case. Then, Mr. Robert Ford, your opinion is always uh, very important. Thank you. Uh, thank you, VP. Um, <coughs> on just just a day before I flew here, my my niece asked me and said, "So when I showed when I showed her." <coughs> the topic I was going to discuss, uh, I was going to be a panelist at, <coughs> at this conference, she asked me a very intriguing question that I kept asking myself over and over when I was flying. She asked me, said, Uncle, don't you think the digital technology that we are consuming today has come earlier than it should have come? That is the world capable and the people capable to <coughs> consume and use the technology that we have today profitably for their own benefit. And I, and I kept juggling my brain back and forth to see if that was right or wrong. So now talking about generative <coughs> AI, it's better to tackle this topic when we have deeply digested and understood what this animal is. <coughs> when I took my class many years ago on computer science, we always thought, when is it going to be a time when technology will take away from us the responsibility to write lines of code so that something else does it. And the AI now is with us today. So to answer your question, is it good or bad? Are we looking at dangers or are we looking at a comfortable world in the, in the, in the, in the, in the time ahead? <coughs> like like uh, Sensei, yes and no. One. I'll just speak specifically one example. The nature of predictability of the power of AI <coughs> is going to help us, especially the global south, in being able to determine the kind of content that goes online before we can even know <coughs> the danger that content is going to produce to us. And I speak this from the the line of authority that, <coughs> that comes from the child online protection, for example. Today, when we look at how we struggle and fight to keep our children safe online, before we put mitigation measure measures, the content is online, and children are consuming this content. Generative AI now equips us with the capability to mitigate that, that we can be able to use those tools to mitigate that. That's the positive part. But the negative part, some of the tools <coughs> like ChatGPT gives you so, <coughs> so good response that many times we don't even need to question it. That each time you ask, the response is so accurate to your understanding that you don't even want to question that. Behind that text, there is a lot that can be questionable, which now puts us at the crossroads of 
what is good for us, what's good, what's not good for us. Because the way generative AI, AI works is that it's just using machine learning to train some uh, software and data to be able to give you what it gives you. That's how it works. So if, if, if what we get seems to us too good to be, to be nice, then we don't question. And then we, we stand at the edge or at a rift to fall off into oblivion by technology. Just, just the two of us. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, um, Mr. Ford. Okay, um, Safa, please go ahead, your opinion. Okay, let me answer by yes. Because I am <laughs> ICT for all this long, I will directly say yes, it can help you. When you're thinking as uh, for economic and you're thinking for developing country, how long we take to analyze just that is it. We take a lot to get insight from data set. But by using generative AI, we can go to insight directly and get in back directly to ec economy instead of wasting a lot of time in routine work of uh, just analyze this data. When you're thinking about that, thinking about how can we save in the cost, how many employees you needed to just analyze this data. By generative AI, we can uh, found your insight directly and it's helpful. Also, when we're thinking about economy, you need to think about financial inclusion and fintech. To deserve real financial inclusion by, by this way of uh, traditional way, you can deserve it for all the citizens of any country. But if you have like generative AI, we can have opportunity to all participants to find the service you need. Like using virtualization access, like using chat, chatbot, any type of AI tools. And when we're thinking about ChatGPT and which can allow you to analyze the data and thinking about how many time you need to just uh, make risk assessment for any bank, for any customer you you have it in the bank to give him just loan. By using generative AI, we can make fraud detection and you can make risk assessment and build model which can predict for you what's the habit of this customer based on the historical information. For all these reasons, I can say for your question, yes, directly. Yes, we have drawbacks, but it can co cover it by any guidelines. Thank you, that's it. Yeah, thanks very much, um, Ms. Safa. Actually, as oh, to the audience, um, actually, as you fully understand that uh, we have a variety of the other um, the nature of the countries as well as the other um, nature of the jobs, uh, every panelist have different, uh, you know, the, um, the occupations, then it is quite interesting and uh, quite um, significant significant and it's quite important um, looking at the other power of AI or looking at the other threats of AI from different angles it is quite uh, important discussion I personally be believe then um, as a result um, four partners here uh, mentioned somehow yes side <laughs> no no one say obviously no so uh, if I understand like that uh, for panelists all here uh, say yes somehow let me just ask one more question while G7 countries um, G7 member countries including Japan are currently preparing the basic guideline of appropriate AI use in societies do you think that the developing and the emerging economies should also prepare original guidelines for the AI use how do you think about that? Let me just ask this question to uh, all the panelists. Uh, let me e invite Mr. Robert Ford first. Okay, I went to the computer science class, but not to the audio class. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, thank you. <coughs> uh, e each time we have a discussion that <coughs> draws a line between developing and developed economies. I struggle. I struggle to <coughs> uh, maintain 
that classification. And uh, I will quickly give an example that <coughs> the, the one part of the world is struggling to, <coughs> to understand or to draw lessons or to draw benchmarks from some of the success stories from another class of people we are talking about. So when we talk about the developed world, and I'll give just a simple example, the, the developing world. What they, what they call developing economies. <coughs> for very many years, many years, for as long as I can remember, the world's financial systems in the developed West uh, were, were based on data that <coughs> runs on plastic cards, right? That each one of us is carrying a wallet with so many plastic cards. For Africa, in the not more than a decade ago, we leapfrogged from that, and for <coughs> they are able to transact using mobile money, and they are circumventing the whole trouble of, of, of the environmental I I impact of keeping plastics in people's wallets. If we were to collectively remove plastics from people's wallets and repile them together, we probably could fill up a country. And this is a very bad effect to the environment that we live in. But <coughs> the other part of the world is failing or is, is dragging its feet in quickly benchmarking on that and say, why don't we have a plastic-free world, at least from our simple cards? And then we can be able to transact with mobile money. So just giving an ex example. So when the G7 is discussing about legal and regulatory framework, about generative AI, they probably need to go down there and see w what is it that there is down there that they can pick from. I, I know countries in Africa that, are that have moved far away in designing and crafting regulatory frameworks for AI and for these other technologies. And they are very, they are very fast in, move in moving towards that. So at some times, at some point, I don't think it requires to be a member of the G7 to determine the kind of policies that are going to guide and mainstream thought process towards how we consume technology for a safer world tomorrow. All right, thanks very much, um, Mr. Ford. Um, can I invite uh, Dr. Salami? Um, can I invite um, Dr. Um, Salami? Yes. Please. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for that. I, I, I largely agree. I think that. Uh, not just because of the several advances made in several parts of the world in terms of thinking uh, AI. I do not think this is a conversation that is entirely unique or the problems are entirely unique to parts of the developing world. I think one of the strange things about technology is it's that it's a great equalizer, uh, both in positive senses and some of the more harmful ones. And I think for us to think about these as unique problems from a frame of exceptionalism may be limiting, and so building out frameworks of governance, frameworks of uh, regulation from uh, an inclusive standpoint, which includes several global participants, is very necessary. Um, my yes, if, uh, you know, to go back to that was deeply qualified, but I will speak to, you know, one specific theme that I mentioned in terms of the injustices of generative AI, um, which is the question of labor. Um, and I think there are two sides to the question of labor uh, in the context of generative AI. The first is that labor and human labor is very critical to building generative AI. So if somebody doesn't label the data that is be used to build a large language model, a large language model does not exist. And this is true of image models as well. Um, and much of this labor is in very many parts of what is called as the developing world. Um, now, those who build AI in that sense uh, that are responsible for the labeling, annotation, marking, categorization of data are never really a part of the conversation. So that's one significant injustice. So while there might be frameworks for governing, regulating generative AI use, the way in which generative AI is made itself um, has a significant geopolitical component. Um, the second dimension of generative AI is a much more downstream effect, which is the question of job loss. Um, and you know, to the point Ms. Safa made, 
job loss is a complicated question that has different meanings in different countries. Um, in mine, which is India, um, we have a population of 1.4 billion uh, where challenges around thinking about employment, uh, job losses are very significant. India is also an IT services company, so a large part of the economy relies on IT service provision. Uh, and again, uh, the question of job losses through the use of services like ChatGPT and generative AI, more broadly speaking, um, is a very significant one. Uh, all of this is to say that conversations about generative AI without starting from the um, how are we going to govern some of the harms just as much as how are we going to deploy it um, might be limiting. So we have to think very carefully about use cases, very carefully about first order, second order, third order consequences of the use of generative AI. That is not to say uh, that there is no use case at all. Um, there are several applications for it. Uh, but governance is a part of deployment uh, is where I'm coming from. I'll pause here and. All right, thanks very much, Doctor. Um, actually, thanks very much for you touch upon the, the aspect of job itself. Actually, um, just um, to share the information to all the other participants here on site and uh, uh, online, uh, recently ILO, the International Labor Organization, just released uh, almost uh, uh, one month plus ago, um, sometime late August. Um, they just used their ILO model to analyze the impact of the other uh, generative AI adaptation to the other 59 countries as a model. Then according to their result, the other impact of job loss aspect is much heavier to the other advanced economy than much less in the other um, developing economies. That means the other, um, a lo lot of meanings are, are contained in that analysis, but uh, I just strongly recommend uh, if you are interested in their job um, you know, analysis or the job impact, of the uh, generative AI. ILO have released the other very good uh, report, working report um, in back uh, in August. But anyhow, if I come back to the other question, um, let me just invite uh, Yamanaka-san uh, for your opinion. Thank you so much. Actually, there's a lot of actually to think about. Yes. I, 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 you know, I agree with the doctors and I agree with Robert about, yes, this is actually, you know, we don't necessarily want actually frag another fragmentation, right? Um, we had a discussion yesterday about data flow or data governance, and we had a sessions, and this question also came up. Do we actually need to create another model or another regulations specific specifically for emerging economy? Answer probably no. Why should it be? Instead, I think the so-called emerging nations should be part of the global discussions on the framework or like you know case makings instead of actually you know trying to fragment it's already it's already a fragmented world you know internet has been fragmented there is also like agenda is fragmented why do we actually need to further fragment this field so ai regulations whether we can succeed or not regulations i'm not sure if we can do this um, you know because there's so many different opinions, but I think it is really important to have this multi-stakeholder approach in terms of actually, you know, having the opportunities for the emerging countries to actually have their voices and input into the formulations of a regime or a mechanisms to um, regulate or to use AI uh, for, you know, for a better world. I think that, I think, is one of the things we need to do. Um, Going back to, I think it was uh, labor side. I think that's going to be a very, very important component. I, that's something that I should have said in terms of potential negative aspect of uh, generative AI. I'm already, you know, like uh, Robert was mentioning about uh, software engineers, or even like the illustrators, or even like uh, storytellers, because I think there was a huge actually strike actually uh, doing the. <coughs> the guild of uh, screenwriters guild in the United States because they were saying, okay, generative AI can do their jobs. Now, I think we're gonna have the Luddite movement. Do you know what's the Luddite movement? That actually happened in the beginning of 19th century when the, the industrializations actually came into UK. 
all the workers, they start actually, you know, destroying the machines. I think we're going to see that if we do not actually come up with a model which is conducive. And another thing is if we do not now re, you know, sort of uh, give them like uh, the opportunity for them to to change their business models, right, or their skills, reskilling them. If you don't do that, I think we're going to see the another Luddite movement for the AI. All right, thanks very much. Reskilling, reskilling, um, another word which the government of Japan is really e emphasizing um, domestically. Okay, Safa, your opinion about my question. Ac according to guideline, when we're thinking about guideline for developing country, we need to think about what you already said about data challenge. Really, we face very critical issue in data in developing country. We can't find system with fully clear data. We need to work beside this data to find main data sets with clear data, then we put it to generated AI. Maybe like this issue we didn't found in J7 country. For that, you we need to put it as a challenges for these guidelines. Also, we need to think about the socioeconomics between this country and G7 when you compare. It is not about the fragmentation of the guidelines, but guidelines should, you need to put in mind also the infrastructure constraint because uh, the infrastructure in this country need to, to put in mind how can you resolve the issue of infrastructure. You can put just generative AI solution for someone who can, can't use it. And also we need to use, uh, to thinking about the capacity building. A lot of uh, people in uh, developing country didn't know about anything about generative AI, we can use it. And th maybe it's a big company, but we didn't know about it. And the, uh, the capacity of building, we need to put it in mind also. But the big issue, the data privacy and labor, as you said. Do you think to wasting time to make a routine jobs, which you already can do it in a minute, instead of thinking about the productivity and quality of the work? If you have staff and can focus more on the quality of the work, it is better to use generative AI in the routine work, and then we can focus in the productivity of the company or the in any industry working by, by, uh, by generative AI. For example, if you're thinking about central bank, you think about if a crisis happened anywhere, you need to calculate what's the impact of this crisis to your own economy. With, with generative AI, you can use this solution to be prediction, to make any prediction for what the impact will be, for example, for Sudan or any country, but we can use the historical data to just decide what the action, what the next action, because it, it can be emergency action, you need to take it instead of to go in the drawbacks directly. Thank you, as I said. Yeah, thanks very much, um, so a very important aspect. Um, actually, he, you beautifully he mentioned about yeah, the opportunity side. Then now, um, I'd like to uh, open the floor for the other question, and the other our panelists can answer as much as we can. Um, actually, I already have received, ah, yes, please, gentlemen, um, come to the other microphone. Um, I already have the other uh, question online, but uh, let me just prioritize um, on-site question first. Uh, please, um, kindly uh, say your name and yes. please, uh, question. So my name is Julius Ender from uh, Deutsche Welle Academy, uh, Germany, Deutschland. So I have so many questions, I don't know <laughs> which, <laughs> which to ask first, because I recently heard a professor from Ghana, he, he was given a talk about uh, AI as a new form of colonialism. So I wonder then why are you not, not mentioning this topic. But my question is, so we are discussing like, a, as we live in a neutral political system, like we have a kind of democratic system all over the world. So, but this is not the fact. I think we, we need to take into account the political system we are living in. So we have democratic states in Europe also and non-democratic states worldwide, especially also Sudan, South Sudan and, and your region. So, and my question is what, what do you think will these technology, especially generative AI, will lead us to more freedom and democracy or will it be the opposite? Because if the uh, authoritarian rulers could 
also rule this technology, maybe it could be worse or maybe it is <coughs> the other way around that will lead to more, more free societies. So this is my maybe too big question, but. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Big question, but a very important question. Any panelists want to answer to this question? Thank you. I think that's that's a very interesting question. Um, the convergence of <coughs> of uh, politics and political play and fair play with with technology, and and to probably answer your question, I'm not a politician. I've never been. I don't wish to be, but <coughs> but I think it depends on 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 how you define uh, those values of democracy and uh, authoritarianism and, and what y whatever you want to call them. In my, in, in my country, <coughs> uh, if, say, a president stays in power four, five, six times and he's doing the right thing, to me that's okay. So is Germany, for example. Germany does not have term limits, right? Germany can have s a head of the political system for five, six, seven terms, right? But <coughs> how the rest of the countries that are in the German League will look at my country is different from how my country is going to look at Germany. So in, <coughs> in Uganda or in Rwanda or in Kenya, if the British system says you can stay in power for as long as your party is, is keeping you in power, that's okay. It's not authorita authoritarianism. But if it happens in, Z in Zambia, that's a different story. So I think it depends on how we look at these politics. And, so, and, and there should be a way in which we validate uh, political leadership. How, at what point that do we define this as being authoritarian or not working in the interest of the masses? A and, I, and, and I'm not saying it's not there. I agree with you. We have countries that are not working in the interest of the citizens. That's okay. So the way we could use this, and I, uh, like I said in the beginning, the power of predictability that generative AI gives us is so immense that with it we could build great potential that can change the way we run politics today and in the future. But for, for, for authoritarianism and dictatorship, and God knows what, I have never belonged there, but I in my view, it depends on how we look at it and how we define it. I would call Germany one of the most dictatorial country because they will keep it somewhere in power for as long as God knows what. So is, is Britain. Oh yeah, I understand. I, I know countries in, in Africa also who have very, very free elections. Yeah, and, uh, yeah of course, absolutely. So <laughs> All okay, right, thanks so much. We will not go to that. So okay. Thank you, thank um, you. Uh, anyone? Can I, can I pose one? Now is a question. I think discussion is getting more spicy, right? <laughs> you know, like it's been like we, s you know, IGF. Someone was calling this IGF is so banira. There's nothing controversial. No one's making anything controversial. So thank you so much for actually asking those kind of questions. Um, <laughs> it's um, interesting questions. Um, you know, for me, I also came from this polity where actually we have uh, so-called free elections and so on. We don't necessarily trust the government, right? Um, uh, where we, it was interesting because I, o I actually asked questions about China. Um, because Chinese actually have the systems of scoring, right, Dr. Son, yes? Now, I was, you know, for, for me, it's a bit difficult to accept that kind of system where I will be watched and the scored, every single movement I did. However, I was told for the average Chinese who never actually had opportunities, you know, because they did not bribe people, they don't have money to bribe, or they don't have the connection. For them, they said, well, now, if I actually are very good citizens, if I actually, you know, do something good for the society, my score goes up, and I actually get different actual opportunity which I never actually got. So I thought it was very interesting, you know, way of looking at the things from the different sides of the coin. Um, so, you know, I don't have the ready answers to it. 
But at the same time, I feel like if, you know, we can keep the privacy, so at least, you know, if we can have like basic human rights. Okay, last 10 minutes, so we, <laughs> we have to be quickly. I, I think, you know, how the polity would actually, you know, manage, um, you know, uh, the, the not control, but the manage the society, I think is should be depending on the society itself. You know, we are here, you know, because so-called developed countries, these seven countries, we are not here to judge them. Uh, that I feel very strongly, you know, worked in uh, developing countries for so long. I don't know, I, I may get uh, hammered by this, but. Yes, <laughs> thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks very much for the, uh, the very good uh, introduction, which going beyond my expectation. But anyhow, um, yeah, thanks very much for the, the very good question and answers. Then I have recognized several, um, actually, people raise hand online on Zoom. Then uh, before that, let me just um, uh, check uh, chat box. And uh, I got the, uh, the one question from the uh, Mr. Mohammed Hanif Garanai. He, he was he is questioning about. Could we apply generative AI in developing countries, in particular uh, education systems? Then, thanks to the other audience online, some of the other uh, actually e online participants kindly answered already. So, thanks very much for the other online interaction spontaneously. So, let me just um, uh, e ask. Miss Deborah Allen Rogers, who are uh, raising your hand, Miss um, Rogers, uh, you have you have a microphone um, which can hear. Uh, or Hello, I'm here. Yes, I can okay, hear okay, you. Yeah, please, uh, please okay, go ahead. Your super, question. Thank you. Yeah, and if they okay, now they'll let my video come, so I'll join all of you in person. Hello, I'm Deborah Allen Rogers. I'm in the Hague. I'm originally from New York City. I have a nonprofit here called Find Out Why. It's a digital fluency lab that promotes uh, digital fluency. And my question, well, first of all, thank all of you on the panel. This is very interesting. And I did appreciate that, that uh, question and even the sort of spicy comments that followed about Germany being dictatorial, which I don't think is, is obviously true in the context of this. But I did want to ask the question about if we could rename I know this is going to sound naive, but just look at my age and know my background um, in design and so on. I'm going to ask this question. Developing countries, we could start, uh, we, we, we're in a transition now. We could change it to, um, I don't know if the banks would agree, but highly healthy, highly functional societies. Because the highly functional digital societies, for example, let's say in Estonia, in Finland, in Norway, I'm living in the Netherlands, highly functional digital societies are great places to come learn for young people on travel expeditions. In Japan, back in you know post-war, they would there was that I was looking for the name of the program, but sent students and young people around the world to develop best practices, to observe and to learn, and then bring it back to Japan and design the society how they wanted it to be after the war. So aren't we at another juncture like that right now that um, India has a lot to teach, the continent has a lot to teach, uh, MENA has a lot to teach. And those societies have young people, 70% are under the age of 30 going forward. So we have to redefine, we ourselves working in this right now have to redefine some of these terms so that we don't fall back on developing world, et cetera, et cetera. It is, it's a new day. And we don't have to spend so much time talking. I'm, I'm kind of breaking my own rule by talking about it so much right now. But I'm, I'm saying that we should redefine it when we give our speeches and when we talk. And also, part of the work I do is to help young people travel the world to see best practices, bring it back home, and then decide how you want to design your own society. But we do have highly functional digital societies, Estonia, Taiwan, uh, the ones I said in Scandinavia and the Nordic countries that are right there for us to look at and watch. Thanks very much for taking my uh, question. Yeah, thanks very much, Ms. Rogers. Great, great comment. And uh, one more person or organization, Ghana IGF Remote Hub, uh, you are raising hand. Please go ahead if you can hear my voice. Please go ahead. Okay. I'm Kweku Kwe Dennis from Pentecost University, Ghana. My question is, for the use of generative AI to create, sorry, does generative AI do good or affect human creativity? 
And if yes, how and what contribution is it making to the human resource? And the second question is, with the fast growth of generative AI, help or help countries with fewer resources and technology, could it boost their development or might it makes the technology gap between countries even bigger? Thank you. Very sharp question. Um, any panelists who want to answer? Hello. Doctor? Um, my name is Joseph. Please. Uh, um, excuse me. Um, can I just uh, go one by one um, due to the other time? Can I just invite the doctor um, Tarayu, uh, to answer to the other first question? I'll try answering very briefly uh, to the first question on creativity. Um, I think the second one around development gaps has been tackled a little bit. Um, but uh, uh, with respect to human creativity, I, it's hard to talk about the effects on human creativity without going back to some of the concerns around, particularly in the context of art, um, around the ways in which generative AI is itself built or on the back of creative work by artists, uh, by sort of pr you know producers or generators of music, makers of music. Um, and to think about creativity as abstracted uh, from some of how generative AI is, is made uh, may be limiting. But uh, it, it could help in the sense that it could aid the the creation of um, works of art, works of you know certain types of writing literature, um, based on which uh, further human creativity and ingenuity is applied. Uh, but it could also have some deleterious effects um, in the absence of efforts to um, for the edu it, it should not supplant in my mind uh, the efforts of the education system of you know human society at large. Uh, to imbibe critical thinking, questioning, uh, creativity, uh, and skills such as those um, in young minds. Um, so we should not see this, to my mind, as a zero-sum game. Um, and particularly the question of creativity must look at how it was born. So thank you, I'll pause. Yeah, thanks very much, Dr. Sarai. Um, uh, Yaman san you want to answer to the other second question? How much the question is on the second one? Basically, trying to actually, if the AI technology is going to be useful for the society, or oh, the yeah, gap, oh, it's a gap, gap, gap between us. Um, <coughs> that's a good question. So, um, I think earlier Dr. Sarai was mentioning about technology being, you know, especially the new technologies actually reducing the gap, because we could actually, you know, there is no sort of hindrance or the or the the introduction sort of barrier is much lower in the digital technologies than many other technologies. Uh, so I think, I, I think it, it does not necessarily uh, be that um, you know, developing country is going to lag behind. Um, and rather, I think it's gonna be more interesting. A lot of actually innovation is actually coming from so-called emerging economies right now. And we may actually see much more interesting like algorithms or a much more interesting like, m you know, like uh, AI models emerging from like, you know, these emerging economies rather than these things is coming from the so-called Western countries. Um, <coughs> so in that respect, I don't necessarily think the developing country is going to be lagging behind, but rather I think with new de digital technologies, I think there's more contributions. Um, I don't necessarily like the word reverse innovation because that's very pretentious, they reverse. But I think the innovations coming from the emerging economies, developing countries, I think that is going to be the trend that we see in the future. All right, thanks very much. Um, actually, we have only one minute left up to the, the end of the session. So apology for the other, um, other um, participants online uh, for uh, giving me the other question. Let me just summarize the, today's uh, session very briefly. Um, as Mr. Yamanaka's last comment mentioned, actually we don't have to uh, look at only the threat side, actually the opportunity, opportunity which every country can utilize the new technology as a sort of uh, innovation to leverage more the economic development as well as the social development is the key 
to discuss more continuously and is the key to emphasize not only G7 countries do the, uh, the leading, the, uh, the guidelines and so other, you know, more than 190 countries can do proactively, proactively uh, to utilize it, to do it for your own business, your own countries in the future. So that could be the, the main message of the, the today's session. And uh, I s I'm sorry about my poor time management. I couldn't pick up all the other questions from the online, but uh, uh, let me just um, conclude this session uh, since time is al already up. So uh, please join me to uh, give the other uh, round of applause to the all the panelists here. Thank you very much. And thank you all the other participants on site and online. Thank you so um, thank you so much.